Hey guys, welcome to another lecture. So today we're going to be discussing in detail lower extremity injuries, knee, ankle and foot. Okay, so what are we trying to do here is have a look to provide a review of the common lower extremity injuries that present in the emergency department. Uh, we're going to focus on knee, ankle and foot. I'm going to try to describe the epidemiology of these injuries. We want to know the history and examination maneuvers to quickly evaluate and distinguish different injuries and the emergency presentations. Then we're going to discuss shortly about what are the diagnostic modalities that are available and a preliminary management because that's all we need to do as a doctor in the emergency department, okay, just to have an idea whether it's an acute injury, whether it's a uh, severe injury or is it a mild injury, whether it's something that needs urgent intervention, whether uh, it's something that can be followed up in the clinic or do you need to call the orthopedics team and get the patient evaluated. Okay, So if you look at the basic anatomy of the knee, we, we know that it's a large hinge joint, contains of the femur, tibia, fibula, and the patella okay that's how the knee joint is formed and then you have your ligaments and menisci we all we all know the basic structure but just to revise so you have tendons which is primarily the quadriceps tendon which is attached to the top of the patella and then you have the patella tendon okay so that's your patella tendon there then you have the quadriceps tendon there Okay, so that's your cardiceps muscle uh, coming up and then the articular cartilage is somewhere here. Uh, on the side of the fibula, which we call the lateral side, you have the lateral collateral ligament and its counterpart is the medial collateral ligament on the inside of the knee. Okay, so if I write it here, so that's inside of the knee, okay, uh, which is also called the medial side and this is the outside of the knee, which is also called the lateral side. Okay. Um, you can also see this from the fibula and the tibia. Okay. Uh, all right. So ligaments, the medial and lateral collateral ligament, anterior and the posterior cruciate ligaments. Um, now, apart from that, you have your menisci, which is the shock absorbing hyaline cartilage inside the knee so you have the medial and the lateral meniscus okay all right so injuries of the knee can be to one of the ligaments so acl pcl uh, medial and the lateral collateral ligament or you can have fractures okay so bony injuries patellar fractures femur fractures uh, tibial fractures and then apart from that you can have injury to the meniscus and the articulating surfaces all right so the key pieces of history, um, you know, whether it's a ligament injury, meniscal tear or fracture can be deduced from the history. OK, so if it's a high velocity collision and the patient is inability to be a weight, then you should think in terms of fractures. ACL tears usually uh, have a history of pivot me mechanism injury and the knees giving away pop is heard at the time of injury. Now for the PCL. It's usually secondary to a blow directly to the proximal tibia. Okay, so front of the tibia, uh, proximal tibia, there's a direct blow that usually results in a PCL tear. Then meniscal tear is associated with squat or a kneel and a twisting injury is the classic pattern of presentation. The patient may present with a clicking or locking and pain on rotational movement. So next is the overuse syndrome, which is uh, associated with occupational recreational repetitive movement. Uh, if you look at all the knee injuries, 40% uh, are ligamentous injuries. So that constitutes the most of the knee injuries. Then you have patella or meniscal injuries and about 25% can be a mixture of uh, or some other injuries as we have already described. Uh, now, if you subdivide these ligamentous injuries, then ACLs constitute almost half of these injuries. Okay, so, so 46%. And that is why 
uh, if you look at the number of surgeries done for knee ligamentous injuries, ACLs would probably occupy the highest number of surgeries done. Okay, so we should always have a systematic approach uh, to evaluation and treatment. Okay, so for knee injuries, start with palpating in the knee and determine where is the maximum area of tenderness. Now examine and note the presence of any effusions. Evaluate the range of motion at the knee. Evaluate the movement and stability of the patella. Then ligamentous stability testing needs to be done in every patient with a knee injury. And we'll be briefly describing the latchments and here draw and posterior draw tests that we need to do. Then meniscal examination has also got some maneuvers that we can do that can give you an idea of uh, whether the patient has meniscal injuries or not. Then neurovascular compromise is something that needs to be done in every patient with a knee injury. Okay, whether it's a minor injury or a major trauma, you cannot forget a neurovascular compromise. If it's orthopedics, if it's a musculoskeletal injury in the emergency department, you have to do a thorough neurovascular compromise. Any doubt, contact your senior. Any doubt, arrange a diagnostic test immediately, whether it's an ultrasound Doppler or whether it's a CT angiography. You cannot miss a neurovascular compromise in the emergency department. And then you should always pal palpate the superior polar patella, not only for fractures, but also for quadriceps tendon ruptures or tendonitis and then inferior patellar pole for prepatellar tendonitis and then bursitis can be diagnosed by uh, anterior pole of the patella uh, palpation. Joint line tenderness is very important in terms of fractures or in terms of meniscal injuries and you palpate the medial and the lateral joint line. So for example, tenderness on the medial joint line may indicate a medial meniscal tear. Tenderness on the lateral joint line may indicate a lateral meniscal tear. Then for teenagers and young adolescents, uh, tibial tuberosity tenderness may be indicative of uh, Osgood Schlatter disease and femoral tibial epiphysis tenderness may indicate a non-displaced fracture through the physis. Okay, now if the patient has effusion, it could literally mean anything. It does not mean a septic arthritis always, as it could result from trauma, it could result from polyarthritis, from infection, from gout, from tumor. Okay, so very important to know that effusion in a knee can be traumatic or non-traumatic. Uh, it could be an infection or non-infective causes. I've listed some of the causes here. You can pause the video and have a look at these causes if you want to. A range of motion is very, very important. The knee should be able to range from hyperextension or zero degrees at least to 130, 135 degrees of flexion. Loss of ex ex active extension and inability to maintain passive extension are indicative of an extensor mechanism of injury. Okay, so the extensor mechanism is what? It's the quadriceps tendon, it's a patella tendon, and it's the patella bone. Okay, so rupture of these tendons or fracture, displaced fracture of the patella bone can result in a negative uh, SLR test or what do we describe as an inability to maintain passive extension. So SLR is a statelet raising test, okay? All right, so patella testing is very, very important. Examine the patella and range of motion and feel for any catches and grinding. Next, you should test the movement of the patella for lateral laxity. You see how much the patella moves laterally, okay? So that's also called as a quadrant test. So look for how many quadrants does the patella move when you try to shift it laterally. For the interior cruciate ligament, uh, the main tests described are, as in the picture, is a Lachman's test, which is performed at 20 to 30 degrees it's flexion. So you hold the femur and you put your thumb on the tibial tuberosity and exert an anterior force and see for laxity. Always compare it with the other leg and see if there is a massive difference. Now, this is a very sensitive test and is more sensitive than the interior draw test. In the anterior draw test, you flex the knee to 90 degree and make sure the quadriceps muscles are relaxed and compare the amount of laxity to the other side, okay? Any increase in laxity as compared to the other side uh, 
may indicate a positive test and may indicate a ACL injury okay now PCL testing is basically opposite to that of the ACL testing so you flex the knee to 90 degree and first observe the lag at muscle maximum muscle relaxation and compare to the unaffected leg now in PCL testing we're basically exerting a force posteriorly so towards the back okay same position same holding position but you're basically exerting the force posteriorly or towards the back as compared to anterior draw where we are um, exerting the force interiorly okay so this is the gold standard for PCL text testing and as I said it's similar to the anterior draw sign the only difference is in anterior draw for ACL testing you're exerting the force and trying to bring the tibia forwards and in a posterior draw test you're trying to push the tibia back on the femur and always always it is compared to the other leg for MCL um, you exert uh, outward force or what we call as a valgus force okay important thing is it has to be done at zero degrees and 30 degrees now the question is why 30 degrees why does the uh, 30 degree come into picture now the testing at 30 degree removes the stabilization which is provided by the cruciate ligaments okay so that's an isolated MCL testing now LCL is very very similar to MCL and uh, the only difference is now we perform a varus test it is again performed at 0 and 30 degrees so in this test we are basically exerting a varus force or trying to push the tibia inwards towards the body or towards the varus position meniscal testing uh, there are a few tests described now they're not very good uh, when when you have knee injuries however mcmore is, is the classic test where we flex the knee and then internally or externally rotate the knee and extend the knee okay we feel for clicking along the joint and uh, look for pain experienced by the patient so what are ottawa's knee rules now we hear these um, rules every now and then but not many people understand so these rules were basically described to uh, limit some of the overuse of uh, radiology in the emergency department so these rules basically say if you have um, a patient who is suspected for a fracture then you have to look at these rules and if the patient does not fulfill these criteria then the patient doesn't need any x-rays so knee rules state age 55 years or older tenderness at the head of the fibula isolated tenderness um, of the patella inability to flex to 90 degrees and inability to bear weight both immediately and in the emergency department so these are the five Ottawa knee rules okay um, now there were a lot of meta-analysis that been done uh, uh, then uh, the basic idea here is that the probability of a fracture if the rules are negative was zero percent okay however the problem is with this day and age it is not worth a patient complaint so you should always get at least a basic x-ray when you when you're suspecting uh, a fracture or a patient comes with a knee injury um, imaging modalities range from x-rays to ct scan this all depends upon your history and examination and what is your clinical diagnosis plain films are traditional standard of care when there's a concern for fracture now remember always always get two views okay so an anterior posterior or an ap view and a lateral view okay uh, additional views include a sunrise view which tells you about the patellofemoral joint uh, if you are suspecting a tibial plateau fracture or if you can't see the fracture on an x-ray and you still have a high suspicion of a fracture ct scan is a diagnostic modality of choice for bony injuries now ultrasound is done when you want to look at the muscles and the tendons so um, quadriceps ruptures ten, uh, patellar tendon ruptures can be diagnosed on ultrasounds obviously mri is the most sensitive modality when you're expecting um, finer 
soft tissue injuries, uh, for example, meniscal injuries and ACL and PCL injuries. Okay, so what do we do when we have these patients present to the emergency department? Now, the first thing is, uh, as I said, always, always do a neurovascular examination. Okay, when once you're convinced, uh, then you should splint the patient, immobilize the patient and give the patient painkillers. You, your job is to first make the patient comfortable, okay? Always keep explaining to the patient what are you expecting, what are you going to do, as this will keep the patient at ease and will help you as well. The next step is to get basic basic uh, workup done. So x-rays is a must. If you're expecting uh, infection, bloods are a must. The next step is based upon what you find on your findings, discuss it with your senior or call the on-call orthopedics team. Okay, so patella fractures. Uh, the rule is very, very simple. So you, <coughs> if a patient is diagnosed of a patellar fracture on an x-ray when the patient comes to the emergency department the one test you need to do is a straight leg raise okay so ask the patient to keep his leg straight and raise it from the bed if the patient is able to do it the general rule of the thumb is he does not need uh, surgery for patellar fracture if the patient is unable to do that is likely to need surgery okay in that case discuss it with the orthopedics team in non-operative management, they're usually immobilized in a knee immobilizer or a hinge knee brace for four to six weeks and then gradually mobilized. Patellar dislocations are very, very common in the emergency department. Gross reduction may be attempted. General extension of the leg with anterior medial pressure on the lateral aspect of the patella is how you close reduce them. Usually this is done in the emergency setting under nitrous oxide. Uh, if there is any difficulty, contact the on-call team. Uh, tibial plateau and distal femur fracture uh, can be nasty fracture. They are usually secondary to a very high velocity. Um, very, very important to examine neurovascular injuries. Popliteal artery injuries is common in these fractures. Uh, the leg should be immediately splinted and we should consult the orthopedics team. Now these patients are at risk of fat embolism, so monitoring is very, very important. And tibial plateau fractures are very common part of the ED presentation. Uh, they're usually common in elderly. Usually strong varus force causes uh, tibial plateau fractures. Uh, by definition, they're all intra-articular fractures and uh, can be associated very commonly with an ACL or an MCL injury. Uh, patients should be made immediately non-weight bearing and they should be splinted um, given analgesics uh, and the orthopedics team should be consulted okay now epiphyseal fractures are seen in children okay so below diagram is what we classify as a salter harris classification so what we see on the most left is normal Type 1 is when there's a fracture through the physis, so that's a Salter Harris type 1. Type 2 is when there's fracture through the physis extending into the metaphysis. Type 3 is fracture of the physis extending into the epiphysis. Type 4 is a combination of 1, 2, and 3, so a fracture extending through the epiphysis, physis, and metaphysis. Type 5 is uncommon um, and is basically a crush injury type variant of type 4 okay so it needs anatomic reduction immediately management is rest ice compression and elevation and contact the orthopedic team as soon as possible so osteochondritis desiccans is of unknown etiology and is related to chronic or acute trauma usually occurs in adolescent males and can be seen on plain films now as the word itself is self-explanatory uh, osteochondritis desiccans okay osteo means bone chondritis means cartilage and desiccans means dissolution okay uh, it's got a poor prognosis if it's closed and if loose it may require an operative intervention now meniscal injuries are very very common uh, so menisci as we know are the crescent shaped or the moon shaped semilunar fibrocartilaginous structures Diagnosis is via MRI. Now, unless the patient present with locking, uh, usually these 
patients can be treated as conservative management by immobilization, non-weight bearing, and refer to the orthopedic outpatient clinics. Uh, ligamentous injuries, basically all the ligaments can get injured, so the anterior or the posterior cruciate ligament, and then the medial or the lateral collateral ligaments. ACL injuries, now 50% are associated with meniscal injuries, that's something we should keep in mind. Um, they are often associated with immediate bleeding and swelling. They can initially be managed with pain relief, bracing, and physiotherapy. However, if the patient has a persistent instability or is a young athlete, the patient needs surgery via ACL reconstruction. Posterior cruciate ligament injuries, on the other hand, have a different mechanism. Okay, so they're usually hyperflexion and dashboard injuries when they're isolated. Uh, now, as compared to the ACL injuries, one thing you need to know about PCL injuries is most of the PCL injuries are treated non-operatively with quadriceps strengthening and physiotherapy. Now, MCL injuries can be due to direct blow or as in part of the other injuries. These patients are also usually treated non-operatively with a knee immobilizer and allow the ligament to scar down and it usually heals really nicely. Long-term management is generally non-operative. Now, lateral collateral ligament is less commonly injured than others because it is protected um, by the other leg. Uh, management is same as with MCL injuries, non-operative and knee immobilization. Important thing to note here is that all these patients should be considered tentatively for an MRI and they should be ruled out for a posterior lateral corner injury. If it's a posterior lateral corner injury, especially in a young patient, they need a posterior lateral corner reconstruction. So they should be referred to a sports injury specialist for further management. Knee dislocations can be very, very fatal. They can be a limb threatening injury. Half of these reduce spontaneously. Two thirds are from motor vehicle accidents. Uh, they are usually associated with multiple ligament injuries, but as, uh, at least two ligaments are ruptured. Neurovascular injury is very, very common, and that's where we've been throughout this talk, throughout this lecture, we've been uh, repeatedly saying about neurovascular examination in all these patients. Uh, reduction should be attempted for all knee dislocations, and as we said, before and after the reduction, neurovascular status should be carefully documented. Arteriogram should be performed in any patient not going to the operating room, and if there are any concerns of vascular injury, vascular surgery involvement should be prompt if there is any suspicion of a neurovascular injury. Coming on to ankle injuries, the ankle anatomy. So we know the ankle is made up of calcaneum, tibia, and fibula. It is made up of two joints, the true ankle joint and the subtalar joint. The true ankle joint contains the tibia, fibula, and the talus, and it allows for dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So you may ask, what does a subtalar joint do? So this is what the subtalar joint does. It's responsible for inversion an eversion of the foot. Okay, so inward movement and the outward movement respectively of the foot. Okay, and subtalar is a joint below the talus and that's where the calcaneum bone is. So that's where the subtalar joint is formed between the talus and the calcaneum. Now, similar to the knee, ankle also has a lot of ligaments. So anterior and the posterior talofibular ligaments, the calcaneofibular fibular ligaments, and then you have the anterior and the posterior tibiofibular ligaments, okay? Medial ligament is what we call as the deltoid ligament. It's one of the most important ligaments of the ankle. Now it's got an anterior tibiotalar part, it's got a tibionavicular part, tibiocalcaneal part, and it's got a posterior tibiotalar part. Now we also use a term called as an ankle ring. Uh, the integrity of this ring is very, very important for stability of the ankle, and it consists of the tibial plafond, which is the distal most part articulating part of the tibia, the medial malleolus with the deltoid ligaments, calcaneum with the lateral collateral ligaments, lateral malleolus and syndesmotic ligaments. Okay, so these seven structures constitute the ankle ring, which is very, very important for ankle stability. Now, ankle injuries can be of many types. Uh, 
uh, ankle sprain or ligamentous injury, ankle fractures or a bony injuries, or like the knee dislocation, you can have ankle dislocations. The most common cause of ankle injury is excessive inversion, which is about 85%. Okay. Um, now, this is important because of many reasons. Why does the inversion normally happen? It's because the medial malleolus is shorter than the lateral malleolus and it allows the talus to invert more than evert. Deltoid is the ligament which stabilizes the medial aspect and is stronger. Now, however, given the above when the erosion injuries happen, they're often substantial damage. So this is very, very important because when you take a history, uh, you should ask the patient what was the position and how did the ankle move when the patient had the injury. Now for any orthopedic examination, think of look, feel and move. Okay, so look at the ankle for signs of deformity, redness or swelling. Feel for tender areas involving the joint line lateral ligaments, syndesmosis, posterior joint line, the medial complex, medial gutter, feel for any effusions, deformities and examine for neurovascular compromise. Joint testing involves the draw test and the tailor tilt examinations. Anterior tailor fibular ligament is tested by the anterior draw test. The calcaneal fibular ligaments are tested by the tailor tilt test and the delta ligament is tested by the erosion stress test. The use of these techniques can be limited by pain, edema, and muscle spasm. So this is the anterior draw test and the tailor tilt erosion stress test. Now, if you remember from our knee talk, we described the Ottawa knee rules. So similarly, we have the Ottawa knee, Ottawa ankle and foot rules. So this again, uh, you know, is based upon the assumption that if you do not satisfy these rules you don't need x-rays however as we said with the ongoing medical legal issues throughout the world um, it's not worth a patient complaint and we should always get uh, x-ray for any suspected ankle injury so the ankle rules say the x-rays for ankle injuries are only required if there is any pain in the malleolar zone and bony tenderness along the distal six centimeter on the posterior edge of the tibia or tip of the medial malleolus or similarly bony tenderness along the distal six centimeter on the outside or which is the posterior edge of the fibula or tip of the lateral malleolus or if the patient is inability has the inability to be awake both immediately and in the emergency department so this again has a sensitivity of almost 100 percent and this can reduce the number of x-rays by 3000 percent but again you need to realize the medical legal aspects and the costs associated with missing even one fracture now ankle sprains are graded as one two and three where three is a complete rupture two is a partial tear and one is where there's microscopic tearing but no macroscopic tearing okay now this again is graded to uh, decide the treatment most of the grade one and two do not require any surgery however grade three uh, usually would require a uh, surgery um, now if you look at what type of ligaments are injured atfl is most likely component of the lateral ankle complex to be injured when you have lateral ankle sprains the ptfl can also rupture if there's a forced dorsiflexion uh, if there's an external rotation type of injury, you could disrupt your medial deltoid ligament. Uh, if there's a force adduction in neutral and dorsiflexion position, it can cause a disruption of the calcaneofibular ligament. Now, syndesmotic sprains are also not very uncommon, and they're about 10% in the ankle sprain and about 18% in football and rugby players. Uh, they're caused by external rotation of the talus or forced dorsiflexion which causes the talus to place a pressure on the fibula. The resulting spreading of the distal syndesmosis as well as damage to the anterior posterior tibiofibular ligament. So initial treatment is described as prices, so protection, rest, ice, compression, elevation, and support. Good return instruction are must as always. All right, so as we said, most ankle sprains have a very good prognosis, 
and they have a full recovery in up to six months. Some patients may need after 12 months. However, if they are not recovering after six to 12 months or they're getting worse, they should get an MRI and should be referred to an ankle specialist. Now, some of the bony injuries can be a malleolar fracture. Um, so it can be unimalleolar, bimalleolar, or trimalleolar. Okay, unimalleolar can be the medial or the lateral malleolus, and similarly bimalleolar. Uh, trimalleolar is usually associated with a posterior malleolar fracture as well. Okay, so anything below the tibiotalar joint is stable, and anything above it could potentially be unstable. So as we said, bimalleolar involves the lateral and the medial malleolus. ED treatment involves reduction and realignment and a check x-ray, uh, then ortho consultation. Now trimalleolar fractures, on the other hand, are nasty injuries. They're unstable, they require surgical fixation in most of those cases, and you should immediately contact the orthopedic team. And to classify, we use Dennis Weber classification. To put it simply, they are type A, B, and type C. Uh, type A is any fracture um, that is below the tibiotalar joint. Type B is at the level of the syndesmosis or the tibiotalar joint. And type C is a high fibular fracture. And they're usually associated with a syndesmotic rupture. And they're very unstable injuries and require operative intervention. So what is a pylon fracture? We have already have a detailed discussion on pylon fractures, but it's basically the fracture of the distal tibial metaphysis with disruption of the tailor dome. It results from an axial loading mechanism which drives the tailors into the tibial plafond. So the foot is forced against in uh, axial direction. Uh, The fractures um, are often open and can be associated with lumbar spine or tibial plateau injuries. Now, Mesonevi's fracture is something we should all know about. So it's a proximal fibular fracture which happens with an associated disruption of the medial ligament and basically an indicative of a syndesmotic rupture. Now, these are all unstable injuries and need to be fixed, otherwise the patient will have an unstable ankle. It's important to perform a physical examination. Now, any patient who's got tenderness in the ankle um, should have examination of the proximal fibula and should have a long leg x-ray um, if you're suspecting this mechanism of injury. So Tillox fracture is basically a fracture of the uh, distal tibial physial region and is a Salter Harris type 3 injury and involves the anterior lateral tibial physis. It's caused by extreme eversion and lateral rotation. Incidence is highest in adolescents because the fracture occurs after the medial aspect of the physal plate closes, but the lateral plate is still to close. So because of discrepancy, in the distal tibial physial closure, you get a telox fracture. Now, ankle, dislo ankle dislocations uh, are um, not so uncommon. Uh, important to note is the fractures are the rule rather than the exception with ankle dislocation. What that means is most of them are associated with fractures. Neurovascular injury is the primary concern of any joint dislocation in the body, is the shoulder, elbow, knee, hip, ankle. If you've got a joint dislocation, the first thing you should look for and do a thorough examination is of the neurovascular status. Now, tented skin may result in ischemic necrosis and immediate redu reduction in the emergency department is utmost necessary. All right, so we've discussed foot and and uh, we've discussed knee and ankle injuries in detail. I'm just going to quickly go through the foot anatomy and the associated injuries. So foot consists of phalanges, proximal, middle and distal, metatarsals uh, and tarsals, which include the calcaneus, talus, navicular, cuboid and cuneiform. It also has some ligaments, but they're not as important as the knee and the ankle. So like the Ottawa knee and Ottawa ankle rules, we also have Ottawa foot rules. 
So an X-ray series is only indicated if there is pain in the midfoot and any one of the following. Okay, so bony tenderness at the base of the fifth metatarsal, bony tenderness at the navicular bone, and inability to bear weight both immediately and in the emergency department for four steps. So if the patient does not satisfy these criteria, then the patient basically does not need an X-ray. That's what the Ottawa foot rules tell you. Foot injuries include toe metatarsal fractures, Jones fractures, Liss Franks fractures, navicular fractures, and calcaneum fractures. Toe fractures are very, very common, but they're usually treated non operatively. Body, body tape the broken toe to an adjacent toe, and they usually heal well. Open or irreducible fractures may require surgery. That's all you need to know about toe fractures. All right, so metatarsal fractures. Uh, are important for the first and the fifth metatarsal. Um, first metatarsal is the least commonly fractured uh, bone in the foot. Uh, it bears twice the weight of other metatarsal heads. Now you treat the minimally displaced or non-displaced fractures with immobilization without weight bearing. Displaced fractures like anywhere in the body require fixation. Now, internal metatarsal fracture, non-displaced and displaced fracture usually heal well with weight bearing as tolerated in a cast or rigid flat bottom orthopedic shoe. Elastic bandages may be equivalent or superior to the cast and we must look for Liss Franks injury and this is a game changer. March fracture is a stress fracture of the second or the third metatarsal uh, and occurs in joggers. Jones fracture is something we've heard uh, a lot of times and is a transverse fracture of the fifth metatarsal. Uh, now it must be at least 15 millimeter distal to the proximal end, and it's got a high rate of malunion. As above, contact the orthopedic steam as soon as possible. There's also a pseudo Jones fracture described, which is an evulsion fracture of the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal. Now, as we said, Liss Frank's fracture is something we cannot miss as it is a devastating injury and can cause severe problems for the patient. Liss Franks is a zone between the midfoot and the forefoot and it basically describes as the tarsal metatarsal joint. So Liss Franks joint is a tarsal metatarsal joint. So you can have any of the tarsal metatarsal joint injured, but the Liss Franks fracture per se is between the first and the second metatarsal. Now it happens because of direct below to the joint by axial loading along the metatarsal along with medial or laterally directed rotational forces. So it's a base of the second metatarsal. You should have concerns for a Liss Franks fracture. Uh, these patients either need an CT or an MRI or at least a weight bearing views. Now some of these patients may be difficult to get weight bearing views, especially when they present with an acute injury and then we are, they're really sore and swollen. So you can see these x-rays um, are indicative of Liss Frank's injuries. Uh, on the lateral aspect, we see that the first metatarsal has got a dorsal displacement. And on the AP view, we can see the other metatarsals uh, are shifted laterally and there's an increased space between the first and the second metatarsal. Now, navicular fractures are very common. Evulsions is the most common, but they are classified as one, two, and three. Um, most patients are placed in a cast for six, way, six weeks uh, and they who heal pretty well. However, if they're displaced fractures or if they're young patients um, who have a sports background or athletic and are highly active, they should have surgery sooner rather than later. Calcaneum fractures are very common as well in the emergency department. They occur in males five times more common than females between 30 and 50 years of age. Uh, they are usually associated with lumbar injuries or tibial plateau fractures. So any patient with a calcaneum fracture, you should take a complete history, number one. Number two, you should always, always examine the spine and look for lumbar fractures, but also should examine for hip fractures, also should examine for knee injuries, as they can be associated with hip injuries and tibial plateau fractures. Treatment depends upon the age and the type of fractures, closed versus open, displaced versus non-displaced, always contact the orthopedic team. Final note, when to call orthopedic for foot injuries, if you have tailless fractures, calcaneum, navicular, intraarticular fractures, keyboard or Liss-Franks fractures, displaced metatarsal or Jones fractures.
Um, I hope this video was informative to everyone. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to comment below and I will answer all of your comments. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, please do subscribe for latest videos um, and share as much as you can.